What makes a good leader? Well, it's probably a question we can answer in all kinds of different ways, but I'm gonna answer it in the sense of the characteristics of leadership. And I feel a bit weird about these characteristics because they're, in some ways they're a bit traditionalist, I think, but nevertheless, they're the ones that are gonna kind of get you some marks. We believe that a good leader has a confident persona. By the way, the word persona means mask, interestingly, so you might wanna reflect on that. We believe that this, po this person is motivated. They are persistent. They are ambitious. They are, for example, enthusiastic. That's what this person perhaps is. We believe this person or this group might be a leadership group have clear goals and they are working towards those clear goals explicitly. We believe that this person is empathetic, understands others, especially if they're using a more democratic approach uh, to leadership. We believe that this, um, this leader has excellent technical knowledge. So that could be probably of the sport that they've maybe played in the past to a high level. That doesn't mean that someone's gonna be a good leader, but perhaps it helps them to apply their leadership skills in context. Um, they're likely to have charisma and presence. I'm not totally sure um, what that means, but for me, it comes from the handbook of the words you might use to describe kind of men and masculine characteristics. So it feels a little bit unbalanced to me, but anyway, there we go. Um, leaders absolutely have to be flexible and adaptable. Now we're gonna look at this very uh, critically in uh, lessons, for example, on multi multidimensional model. Maybe you are or you're not gonna be studying that one, but that one's certainly one that would relate to that. And we believe um, that leaders need to be good communicators. And I would stress that communication is at least 50% listen they're listening and 50% talking. We tend to focus good communicator on someone who can talk, right? Well, what about the listening side? So there are characteristics. And I wanna ask the question of from where do leaders come? And I don't mean geographically necessarily, from where do they come from? And I want to address two possibilities with you. So the first possibility is we have what's called an emergent leader, an emergent leader. Now, what is an emergent leader? It is someone who is appointed from within. So think about examples where a leader appointed from a leader comes from the actual group that they're then going to go on to lead. Now, I personally think something like an experienced performer become, becoming a coach or a coach becoming a caretaker manager is a good example. So let's put that one in. Experienced, an experienced performer, experienced performer becomes a coach. I mean, that for me would be a really good example, becomes a coach or you know, player coach might be. That's a really good example of what we mean by an emergent leader. Whereas what we're gonna describe over here as a prescribed leader is something else altogether. A prescribed leader is someone who was appointed from outside. Now there's lots of examples of what this could be. It could be that a team uh, signs a new player to their cricket club and that player immediately becomes the captain of the team, say. But the one of the ones I really like, and there's lots of examples of this, is where you get a non-native coach of a national team. So for example, in the UK, we have got a whole series of people very in sort of very high level gymnastics who are from the uh, former Eastern Bloc countries and also from Asia. So that would be an example of prescribed leadership expertise being brought in from a uh, national team coach. Um, uh, being brought in from our side. Now, with those things understood and agreed, I really want to get to, to the main meat of this tutorial. I want to talk to you about leadership styles, and I'm going to talk to you about the autocratic st style, or what we might call the task-oriented style. We're going to talk about the democratic style, and we are going to talk about the laissez-faire style, which I'm not very good at pronouncing because my French is terrible. Um, but we're gonna talk as well about the laissez-faire style. So these are the three styles of leadership we need to have a really fundamental awareness of. So let's take autocratic. What is this, first of all? It's probably a word, I'm pretty sure you would have come across this before. You probably have a bit of an awareness of what it means. Well, I'm gonna sort of suggest to you that it's all about get job done. That's what autocracy is about. You get done what needs to be done. It's task-oriented. In other words, it's focused on the outcome and the work that needs to be done. Leader makes all decisions. Leader makes all decisions. You've probably met people like this, right? Um, does it remind you of any teachers? Anyway, didn't mean to say that. Did I say that? It didn't come out that way. 
and they engage in little consultation. Now, that's not fair what I said about teachers. I'm a teacher, by the way, obviously, and I feel really bad about what I just said, but we all know that in, in schools there's always a few that act like this, aren't there? You know what I mean? Now, let's go through why this autocratic uh, leadership style would be particularly good. So first of all, interestingly, this is common if we have a male leader. It's also common if male group. So we tend to find autocracy is more common with a male leader and the participants being male. It also tends to happen for large groups. So for example, if I was teaching a, a PE lesson and it was a wet weather lesson, I was doing some uh, fitness training or circuit training in the, in the small gym with 50, 60 people, I'd be quite autocratic in that situation. It's really good because it develops a clear message what is expected, the task orientation, is explicitly rendered for the participants. We also know that the leader seems confident. So it makes the leader seem like they know what they're talking about, unless, of course, they don't. But the leader comes across as confident. It imposes conformity. So the participants develop conformity to the lead. Now, we might see that as quite negative, but actually in some situations, let's say dangerous situations, that's actually quite important. It's good for beginners. Okay, so where beginners don't really know what they're doing yet, let's say throwing a javelin for the first time, it's really good for that sort of uh, situation. It's really good if time is short. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, it's a simple example, but think about a PE teacher, for example, wanting all the gym equipment put away quickly at the end of the lesson. They can get quite autocratic in that situation, right? And it's also if the, it, the also if we've got any sort of um, notion of danger. So if we're taking part in something dangerous, such as an inversion on a trampoline for the first time, first somersault, autocracy might be relevant in that case. Now, we want to look at democracy next, which I had in this kind of orange colour here. So we want to look at the democratic approach. Now, a couple of things about democracy, word which, of course, you'll know really, really well. It's all about being person oriented. So therefore, it's about relationships with people rather than the job itself. So this is all about building relationships so that the job gets done well. And by the way, it's a very effective model in the situation we're going to describe in a second. We have shared decisions. So members, as well as the leader, can share in the decision-making process. It involves consultation. So people get to have their say, and it is about sharing and especially sharing responsibility. So what, why would we use democracy? Well, guess what I'm gonna say here? Not always, with lots of exceptions, the leader is female. The group is female. Okay, now again, this is very much a generalization, but females tend to prefer democracy. We also tend to find that this is particularly effective if the group is friendly to one another and there's good relationship. We also find it develops ownership. So think about the shared goal. If the participants have contributed to that shared goal, they're more likely to value it, right? It works if there is time. So I'll just put is time. There's plenty of time available, therefore we can act democratically. It's really good for wider opinions and ideas. Wider opinions and ideas. Really good for developing those wider opinions. And ideas it's really good for experienced performers you know imagine like Olympic level performers they don't just want to get told that necessarily everything they have to do they want to understand why and be able to contribute to that process it's also good for members who prefer democracy so if the members the, the group prefer democracy and I've mentioned females as an example experienced performers as an example that would work particularly well and it works particularly well with older members you know people who have got more experience they don't just want to be told snapped at told what to do right so these are examples where democracy works now the final model we're going to use and I'm going to rather cruelly put it in red here it's a bit harsh is the laissez-faire model now it's not a well-respected model of leadership just to be clear this is where the leader lets things happen so they don't take action they allow actions to develop without their input in other words the leader stands aside leader stands aside so start to think about why and in what situations someone might do this so i'm going to give you the negative first i'm going to give you the negative in this sort of pinky color it provides a lack of direction okay so if someone lacks leadership skills we might end up in this scenario a lack of direction members will end up with a lack of guidance you know not knowing what it is that's expected of them or what they need to do we might also find that people give up 
a lack of persistence. People give up. But there are some strengths to this model, and sometimes in sport where this would be used. It's useful in specific situations. And I'm gonna say specifically, it's useful in team building. And it's, you know, think about those activities where you have to cross the acid river just using a plank of wood and a pair of trainers. But it could also be that it's useful in what we call OAA, outdoor adventure activities. So for example, we want people, rather than being told what to do, we want people to discover what to do. So it's really good for what you might refer to as discovery. Now, don't get me wrong, if we have to be lay a performer down a mountainside, we're not gonna leave it to it. We're gonna be quite autocratic in that situation because it's a safety issue, right? But let's say fair, stand aside, allow the members to take those decisions is one consideration and can also describe quite often when leadership fails. Thank you.